want your comment and reflection on what we can do with this young population. I come from Uganda. I see it's the youngest, one of the youngest countries in the world. Uh, Africa, so uh, we are about 1.2 billion people. Uh, in 20 or 30 years, likely will be more than two and a half billion. Exactly. Uh, mm. That population is already baked. Mm. Uh, a lot of people think that they can run family planning or raise awareness. They're not going to stop us to double the population because it's baked. Uh, this, the young people are between 14 and 23 years old. They are going to have an average of two or three children. Africa, we have sometimes eight. So we know for sure that uh, we are going to reach more than 2.5 billion people uh, in the next uh, 20 years, surpassing China and India. That, that's being discussed uh, today. Yeah. How can we, in the implementation, we talked about 10 years. Uh, we've, we are doing, we've done the first 10 years of our Agenda 2063, the Africa we want. Uh, the next decade, my worry is, is, and concern is, how do we now bring in this young population? Uh, how can we involve them? How can, how can we support them to lead? Uh, especially in our sector conservation, it's all about their future. Mm. A lot of the conservation is futuristic in mm. terms of the investments we are making today. is what is really going to determine the life uh, our children and, grand and their grandchildren and their children are going to enjoy uh, on this continent. I speak a lot with these young people. Uh, some are really taken on this. Others think that they are very young. Uh, they really, others think that they need to be given permission that you oh, know, you know, the leaders are not involving us, and I say, w why would you wait for them to give permission? Because the young people that liberated this continent in the sixties, uh, the you know, Yerere, Lubumba, and uh, the others, they were in their twenties too, uh, and their war was independence, uh, liberating liberation, uh, and they did it, and they did it without Facebook, or WhatsApp, or Instagram. Uh, uh, so, what is the message and what ideas, and I know when we talked a couple of months ago, you really so much interested in uh, this issue of young people and, uh, and you've thought so much about it. Uh, what can we do? What, what are they missing? Uh, what message do you have for them? Uh, yeah, uh, first of all, uh, uh, Kadu, I think uh, yes, there is uh, development on expense of uh, uh, destruction of nature and also wildlife. Uh, but there are encouraging also best practices. Last month, uh, we had um, you know, a, a webinar uh, with uh, the former president of Botswana and the first lady of Kenya. I was also involved in the uh, Elephants Protection Initiative and Wildlife uh, Human Conflict Issues. We were talking on, on that uh, uh, virtual uh, you know, engagement. Mm. But I was so much encouraged what the elephants number increment in Botswana. Yeah. And similarly also in Kenya. So there are best practices we have to emulate uh, and uh, you know, other countries can also take over uh, the way how uh, these two countries has been able to increase the number of elephant population for the last 10 years. So I think if we are able to pass this message to mm. other African countries, mm. we could also achieve the same results or maybe even better results learning from what they have done. So there is, it's not always, uh, you know, a, a negative uh, yeah. thinking, mm. but there are positive things we have to capitalize as well. Of course, uh, the destruction is still continuing on. Uh, so I think this is one point. The second issue is regarding the inclusion of uh, our young people into uh, the development process as well as conservation uh, and uh, biodiversity 
uh, you know, conservation issues. Uh, to me, I mean, uh, I was always remembering one of uh, the elderly person in Ethiopia when we were talking about uh, young people. He said something in the local language. He yeah. said, these young guys, they don't have belly only, they have also hands. See? Don't consider that they are just eating something, but yeah. they have hands to deliver. So they can produce, they can you know, engage in development, they can engage in conservation. And there are a number of uh, uh, facilitating uh, innovations at this time, uh, like technologies, the digital technology, which they are much more friendly than uh, those of us who are older. So why don't we capitalize on those innovations, engaging them into development process? Let me give you one simple example. Africa has huge potential in agricultural sector and in sustainable farming. And this farming cannot be like what our forefathers were doing. But in most African countries, we still are in that stage of farming, which is also destroying nature as well, mm -hmm. because we are clearing our forests for increasing the land size, rather than intensifying the existing land. So technologies can help us to intensify in a smaller land mass we can produce huge amount of food for consumption, even healthy and nutritious food, which the human nutrition requirement tells us. Who else can do this except the young people? So I think if we, can, we are able to bring these young people into precision agriculture, modern agriculture, mechanized agriculture, which use some mechanical advantage, I think we can make more productive young people who engaged in this. Production of agriculture doesn't mean only production. It's a whole food system. They can engage in other platforms like market access. They can engage in, uh, you know, in producing inputs. They can engage in, in you know, processing of this food in a healthy manner and sustainable manner. So the whole value chain can employ thousands and millions of you know, uh, young people into this sector. The only thing is we have to open up our eyes and look into the opportunity because they are there to help our development process to continue. Um, even you know, at the end of this process, we have waste management. We have to let these young people to manage the waste. I am, I am seeing now in your compound, you are making a circular you know, production system. And that circular production system can work everywhere. Mm -hmm. So it's a job. Look, rural Africa needs energy. And we can produce this energy from renewable sources. Technologically, these young people are very friendly to those mm -hmm. solar, wind, geothermal, and thermal energy that can be produced than the usual diesel uh, and, and yeah. you know, production of energy. So this is, there is huge opportunity going green and creating jobs for our young people. So I think uh, there is huge possibility. The only thing is we have to open up our eyes and see to it. And they can be a positive uh, you know, accelerators of growth and development in a green way than the usual conventional uh, growth uh, pattern and, and trajectories we used to uh, do our business. So I think they can come up uh, this way. And for example, cities. We need a green cities. And if we want to greenery our cities and Stops. produce uh, you know, in a green manner and engage in energy efficient ways, it is the young people who can do that. And huge opportunity in front of us to engage yeah. our young people. That's, yeah, excellent examples because, uh, you know, 
you reminded me a question I was asked and I wish I had talked to you before because I, I was having a conversation with one of the heads of state uh, here in Africa and I was telling him the importance of conservation and wildlife and you know and he, he turned to me and said but can't do you know uh, I've never seen a voter asking for more elephants or asking for more protected areas uh the the you know they ask for jobs uh, they ask for better health systems they you know employment uh that uh, it was very clear to me that uh, uh this uh, uh, this uh, head of state i was talking with he didn't clearly see how environment or conservation or green i think can actually create employment or uh, increase, grow the economy or uh, because I, I think it was, it's, it's always seen as a hindrance. Uh, mm. uh, it's, it's industries, it's, it's oil extraction, it's uh, uh, much as data doesn't support that because I think you look at our continent, uh, our, our wealth is above the ground. Yes. Uh, uh, not our comparative advantage uh, in terms of resources we have in, in a competitive world. They are above the ground. Uh, there's nobody else who has them. Uh, a lot of the things we are struggling to extract underneath, uh, they are, you find them everywhere else in the world. Uh, but somehow we are concentrating so much on that uh, because the technology available to us is is coming from outside elsewhere but here that uh, that we just it's easier for us to use that instead of adapting a lot of that it seems to me that uh, uh, we really spending a lot of our time as africans uh chasing the west yeah uh, trying um, to be uh yeah. as our cities to be much new york or even better uh, Dubai or even better. Yeah. Uh, we know the consequences, some of us, but we've been... Uh, what, what message would you give a leader like that or an economic planner or uh, a budget director? I, I met a budget director that, you know, last year uh, and having a conversation with him, I asked him how much value of uh, forests uh, in his country and national parks and his response was well you know we banned the export of timber in this country and therefore forests don't contribute to the economy mm. but he is in a country where 80 percent of the people population depend on forestry for energy uh, yeah. but here he is he's telling me that because they don't export timber Therefore, forests are not, are not factored in the budget. Yeah. That um, national parks, tourism is very low in his country, and therefore national parks uh, are not contributing much to the, to the wealth of the country, whereas I told him about 70% of his fresh water in, in, in his country, the sources of that fresh water are from national parks. Hmm. What would... What message would you send to such leaders who are making very, very important decisions today that are going to determine the future of our continent? I think uh, one of the, the, the suggestions I have is, uh, why don't we see uh, East Asian countries? Uh, because sometimes, you know, if you don't see it practically, you might not easily believe in theory. Uh, but if you see East Asian countries, now the, their land mass, uh, 60%, 70% of their land mass is covered by foresters. Uh, they are the ones who have full employment. We are talking about no employment, isn't it? Our politicians are talking yeah. about employment. They have full employment, whereas they have 60% of their uh, land mass covered by foresters. Yeah. They reforested. They restored their degraded lands, and they were able to have a balanced environmental uh, things in their own countries, most of them, not all. So the thing is, it is, it is possible 
to, to get benefit out of the nature we are in uh, and uh, balance and look into the comprehensively what's happening. The problem with the finance people, you know, our education system in general, if you are an accountant, you never think about uh, foresters because you haven't been introduced this in your school. You always see the mathematics and the accounting procedures and that it is well done. And you see the tax system and uh, you know, the duties, whatever, collect money and wherever that brings exactly a tangible uh, money to you, you don't consider the intangibles as money. So that's our problem. And I think leaders have to see comprehensively the things that benefit. Some leaders see it, some do not. So the thing is, I think there should be an advocacy, proper advocacy to tell them. I don't blame them yeah, no. because they didn't have that exposure. So what matters is exposure and we need to give them exposure. We need to give them understanding. For example, the Ethiopian highland and the forests, if you know the Bali mountains yes. uh, forest, we have uh, all the countries, Kenya, Somalia, Ethiopia itself, all the rivers that flow, the big rivers that flow into these countries from the Ethiopian Bali highland, if we destroy the Bali mountains national park, it is destroyed. So everybody knows that it will be destroyed. Even the, the peasants there, they understand that all the water is coming from that forest. And you can't say that this forest doesn't have a value. It has huge value because the, all the irrigation down, downstream depends on this forest. And otherwise you can't produce in agriculture downstream the lowlands. So keeping our forests is very important. So you have to understand the water cycle then. The accountants should understand what it means. Yeah, yeah. Otherwise he doesn't see the benefit out of it. So it's not tangible and it's not accounted in terms of money. So I think uh, this, th that's why a comprehensive planning yes. is essential. Understanding the whole situation and the multidisciplinary approach is very, very essential. And yeah. the accountant also should sit down there right. in the planning process. One of the things uh, uh, we've, we've, we've looked at uh, in terms of how conservation is done on this continent and who is involved and uh, how decisions are being made uh, around the sector itself and how Africa uh, shows up uh, in some of the discussions around uh, our natural resources. Uh, we are playing in a globalized world. Uh, we cannot uh, blame so much ourselves without factoring in the environment we are working in. So it's a globalized world. We need to engage the world. Uh, we need to meet the world where it is. Uh, we are coming last uh, in terms of development. Uh, there's a huge opportunities uh, from that because we can learn from the mistakes of others. Uh, the disadvantage is that, uh, you know, we, we might not have the, 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 the financing uh, aspects to, the, to our, finance our ambitions mm. because we are coming from behind. And therefore, we really need to strong partnerships with those with the money, with those with the technology. Uh, and that requires different conversations and, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, discussions and being at, in the right places and uh, create, in creating these partnerships. Uh, for conservation, uh, as a conserv Af an African conservation, we are determined, uh, given the experience of this continent, and based on our lessons, 60 years I've been doing conservation on this continent, uh, there is a realization that uh, part of the problems wildlife or conservation is faced on this continent is lack of Africans involvement. That the sector itself is laid mostly uh, for good reasons, uh, obviously, uh, by international 
uh, either NGOs or financing. Mm. Uh, the, uh, the, and the result of that is that uh, pretty much we have outsourced uh, the responsibility of our, to our heritage, to our natural resources, mm. which is our biggest wealth uh, for, to others to conserve. Uh, and the, another result is that others have started taking us for granted. In a sense, just this, this week's conversation and discussion around climate change, uh, as we speak in Glasgow, uh, UK, uh, uh, it seems what I'm hearing is it's almost like Africa is just a victim. Uh, and uh, uh, somebody's going to come to help us uh, deal with this. Uh, uh, it almost implies that we are not part of the solution. Uh, uh, we are at the receiving end. Whereas we look at data uh, and you look at what we have here, we, we have the largest population of mammals compared to a, the rest of the world. Mm. Uh, 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 whether it's uh, birds or reptiles, uh, the majority of them for the continent, for the entire planet, mm. uh, they are here uh, on, on this continent. Uh, you look at fresh water, a uh, big percentage of fresh water as our engineer is found on this continent compared to any other continent. Uh, so uh, Africa has a responsibility to the world. Uh, but I don't see the world seeing it that way. Uh, you see, it's almost like they are helping us and not them uh, to, to do this kind of conversation, conservation. And therefore, how can Africa show up? What do we need to do really to show up in these conversations and take our place, which we must, in order to, uh, to play a role in this globalized world? Uh, the other, uh, also here on the ground, uh, for Africans to take leadership, and stop outsourcing uh, some of the aspects of uh, uh, conserving uh, our, uh, our, our natural resources. So I guess the issue I'm driving to is the, how do we engage the world differently in order to secure the continent we want? And, and what's your message to the rest of the world uh, that, uh, you know, we have these resources, we are a rich continent, mm. uh, and uh, we are seeking, we, are, we should be just, we should be partners. Yeah, I think um, uh, it has, it has uh, also its basis. Uh, this is not happening simply because uh, the guys uh, in the West are, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, looking Africa in a different perspective. It has its basis in a colonial legacy. Um, this is reflected not only in conservation, but in all spheres of uh, engagement with the global community. So it is our responsibility. It's not these guys or, or the Western uh, people or, or people in other continents uh, to think about Africa correctly. It's we who should make this happen. And the responsibility rests on us Africans, not outsiders. So I think our leaders has to show the proper uh, face of Africa at this time and the contribution this continent is making to the global community. We are always, as you said, at the receiving end and we are not you know, expected or supposed to be contributing to the global uh, wealth and safety. Um, <clears throat> to me, I think, <clears throat> I believe again, that uh, we have to rationally, and our researchers, our academic community, or scientific community should, you know, should, uh, you know, distill uh, the contribution that Africa is making to the global community. And that is lacking. And we should do that. That's our responsibility. And political leaders also should advocate in this regard. So the African Renaissance agenda has this in its view, and we need to, uh, you know, um, discuss these things in depth and make our counterparts understand uh, the contribution we can make, the potential we have 
as an Africans. You know, the globe has become a one village. And at this time, I think it's a symbiotic relations rather than just uh, somebody who is supporting and the other one is receiving. And uh, so, therefore, uh, our contribution has to be spelled out properly. And I think this is the right time. Yeah. Yeah. It's the right time because uh, thinking that they destroyed African continent, they also been destroyed yeah. uh, themselves from what's happening now globally. And maybe I, I suspect, I suspect there will be a new colon colonial uh, aggression coming in the future because uh, still Africa is a place where you can dwell in a peaceful and manner. But again, um, there are also calamities that are coming to Africa as well. You know, different African locations mm. do have uh, a greater impact uh, by the climate change. There are areas where uh, there will be huge drought and associated famine, and similarly huge flooding, and again, uh, destruction of property and livelihood. So we need to be very careful in analyzing these kind of things and our scientific and uh, educational uh, communities has to bring uh, this idea because idea matters and rationalizing uh, this thing matters the most. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, but I, I will not complain too much about it because we are in the same village and we, we need a symbiotic relations. Yeah. Those who developed uh, early on has to support developing countries because that, no that, that's the responsibility. Yeah. We need climate justice because we didn't contribute to this climate change so much, but we are the most hard hit in the continent. And those who contributed to this has responsibility to engage and resolve in the adaptation process. We have to adapt to this situation. And I think I'm not so much happy with what's going on with the COP uh, yeah. uh, process now in Glasgow. Uh, still, uh, uh, people are not eager. You know, Ethiopia championing. My predecessor was, uh, you know, the committee chair for heads of state and government. Uh, when the 100 billion uh, yes, was decided. Yes. That's long ago. And nothing happened so far. Mm. They are trying to calculate this in terms of the uh, donation or grant that has been given to Africa, uh, the usual conventional one, to sum up to bring to 100 million, 100 uh, uh, billion, which is not fair. So I think fairness, justice is very essential. Otherwise, you know, this globe is a common for to all of us, and they will also be the hard hit uh, uh, as it is seen now. So um, what we need to do is we have to collaborate. We have to cooperate with uh, each and every individual countries and leadership in, in the global setting. And the United Nations, our, our global institution, has to be strong but I don't see that it is so strong as it should be. Yeah. And our continental organization, the African Union, has to be also very strong in this regard, but it's not putting the African voice in a proper sense. And that our voice has to be heard. Yeah. And we need to work very hard at, in this yeah. regard. Thank you. And, and as, uh, as an Af Africa Wildlife Foundation, we are really bent and committed to ensure that the African voice uh, is promoted, that uh, especially in the case of uh, conservation, that uh, Africans start hearing other Africans like you uh, explaining why conservation is important. Uh, I think uh, that is missing in many media channels and, uh, uh, and houses. Uh, many of us grew up just hearing Europeans and North Americans telling us why elephants are important. And many of our colleagues uh, thought that this is a, a foreign agenda. Uh, it has nothing to do with them. But even the, sh the way tourism is shaped, many of people think that it's for foreign arrivals. 
it has nothing to do with them that protected areas somehow they are being conserved for international uh, uh, community. But like you, uh, the optimism is up in the air. I think he, um, any young person who is listening to this conversation, they, you know, they know that uh, they are so fortunate. They are, you know, most educated Africans generation uh, that has ever existed on this mm. continent. Uh, mm. uh, they have the technology, they have the experience, they, they have the education, uh, and uh, there is no reason why they, they can't do whatever they want for, mm. for this continent and meet the rest of the world, their colleagues, uh, at a level that is expected uh, of us. Uh, so in, in the in the finishing uh, this conversation, I, 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 are you optimistic? For sure, yes. Because um, uh, the globe has gone into different challenges and we were able to overcome those challenges in different uh, you know, eras. And I think this challenge also is, is, can be tackled. And I am very much optimist uh, with the coming generation to take responsibility and also our generation uh, you know, passing this message to the younger generation in the proper sense uh, can bring a big change. And there is also growing understanding by Africans and beyond uh, that there is a need for a more nature conservation at this time. So this is a time when we have to, you know, as, as I say goes, that hit the iron when it is hot. Yeah. And if we can hit the iron uh, when in this hot period of time, then many people can understand. We can shape the iron properly. So I am very much optimist uh, at this time. And, uh, but of course, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, measured optimism. If we don't deliver, then of, of course the danger is so big, uh, so enormous. So it's, uh, you know, uh, as I said, uh, yeah, a measured optimism. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for the great conversation uh, today and uh, all the best. And it's great that uh, with optimism, although it's measured, but it's very much appreciated. Thank you very much. And to our viewers, Thank you very much for tuning in and we'll see you again in the next episode.